Today on the Expect Miracles podcast, we have a very special guest, Dr. Ray Drury, who is a knee, chest, upper cervical chiropractor out of Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, every time uh, you talk upper cervical, Dr. Ray's name always comes up. He does some phenomenal work down there. He's been doing it for a while, and I'm really excited to uh, just talk about upper cervical and his life story and how he got into it. Dr. Drury, how are you today? I'm doing great, man. Beautiful day here in the Carolinas. So I uh, figured, hey, let's go outside and do this, right? Absolutely, yeah. So, Dr. Ray, uh, where are you from originally? Kentucky. Kentucky. All right. And uh, were you in a chiropractic family, or is that something you found later in life? Well, I didn't start off in a chiropractic family. Actually, uh, when I was about ninth grade, I decided I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to help people. At the time, all I knew was medicine. Uh, about a year later, uh, my parents were divorced, but my dad uh, called me up and said, hey, I am moving to Kansas City and going to chiropractic college. And I'm thinking, wow. okay, whatever. You know, I mean, I all I knew was they did something to backs, you know, basically kind of like a back doctor or something, you know. So he went off to chiropractic school. I went on through high school, got into undergrad, started taking my prereqs for medical school. Uh, How old was graduated. your father when he started uh, chiropractic school? Sorry? How old was your father when he uh, – uh, jumped into chiropractic school. So he graduated when he was 43. So wow, that's impressive. About 38, actually, by the time, because he had to go take some prereqs too before he actually got uh, fully admitted. So that's really amazing. I love hearing stories about that. Never too late to uh, jump into fully what you want to do. Yeah, he actually was a concrete salesman uh, and had some uh, back problems and ultimately some prostate problems he had had for years and went to several medical doctors and no one could help him. So he wound up going to the chiropractor because of his back. Well, subsequently his prostate stuff cleared up and he started going and talking to this guy and he started explaining to him how the body worked and how, you know, yeah, you know, he adjusted his spine and his prostate. So he was like, man, this is cool. You know, I want to do this. So it turns out that the doctor he went and saw for the first time actually worked in the BJ Palmer Research Clinic. Wow. Pretty cool. So he was around BJ. Yeah. Really yeah, cool. and I never even got to meet him, but uh, I heard all about it. Uh, so ultimately, uh, my dad got out of chiropractic school. I was still planning to go to medical school. Uh, we went on a little fishing trip, which he and I used to do before he went away to school. And uh, during that trip, he kept talking to me about chiropractic and how the body's a self-healing organism, doesn't need any help. Just, you know, and ultimately, at the end of that week, and I'm pretty hard-headed, I get it from him. Uh, but by the end of that week, I was like, man, maybe there's something to this chiropractic thing. And I started researching a little bit more. And when it was all said and done, I was like, you know, if I, if I go to medical school, my dad is going to make me feel pretty <laughs> stupid the rest of my life because every <laughs> argument I brought up, you know, well, uh, if they get a headache, you think it's from a Tylenol deficiency, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I was yeah. like, why not go after the cause instead of masking stuff with, uh, you know, drugs? Absolutely. Well, that led me to chiropractic school. And then I went to Logan, uh, primarily because my dad went to Kansas City, Cleveland, said, don't go there. Uh, he knew a guy that went to Life that said, don't go there. We knew a guy that went to Palmer, said, don't go there. We didn't know anybody that had been to Logan, so that's why I wound up at Logan. Uh, and good and bad, uh, Logan was not, not what I would classify a good chiropractic school. It was a good school to pass boards. Absolutely. Uh, they taught us everything we needed to know to pass boards, a lot of medical diagnosis and stuff. <clears throat> but fortunately, while in chiropractic school, um, I got sick. You can call that fortunate or not. <clears throat> but I was in pretty bad shape. Um, what was going on? Well, so I school was always pretty easy to me. Uh, I didn't really have to study that hard. And all of a sudden, I got stupid overnight. Um, I couldn't study. I mean, I studied for hours and walk away and come back and couldn't even tell you what was what I had just read. <clears throat> then I started having difficulty sleeping. My energy was bad. My gums bled constantly. Really? I, mean, I would brush my teeth and it would just be bright red every time I did. Um, and I just got achy and achy. And I was into, at the time, I was trying to get into Gonstead. There's doing, we were scoping. I, I like the idea of Gonstead more so than any other full spine because at least, you know, they only adjusted two, maybe three segments, rarely cross sympathetic, parasympathetic. They used an instrument to mm -hmm. check people, determine when to, when not to. They x rayed everybody pretty specific analysis. So I, I, from a full spine standpoint, it made m the most sense to me. 
but I started getting checked and I was getting adjusted every day. I mean, mm -hmm. they always scoped some break somewhere and, but my health kept getting worse and worse. So I met a guy at a seminar uh, that uh, said he did this upper cervical stuff and he said, you should come down and check it out sometime. And I'm like, man, you know, why would you only adjust two bones when you're 24? You can adjust those two and then the others as well, right? And it didn't make a lot of sense to me, but my health kept getting worse. And so finally I called that guy up and I said, hey man, um, you mind if I come down and just follow you around, check you out? And he said, yeah, come on down. So I went down <clears throat> while I was there the guy checked me, x-rayed me, put me on a knee chest table, gave me an adjustment. Uh, I thought, okay, you know, this is cool, interesting. He post-scanned me, you know, things changed, went from a crooked line to a straight line, whatever that meant. And uh, so I drove back two hours back to St. Louis. <clears throat> About the time I pulled in the driveway, I didn't really feel sick, but I had this cold sweat come over me, mm. nausea. I mean, I took off towards the house and ultimately threw up all over my front porch. Really? Walked into the house, rinsed my mouth out, laid in the bed, lights on, fully dressed, cussing the dude, right? Because before I was sick, yeah. I wasn't sick. Yeah. So woke up 12 hours later in the exact same position, fully dressed, lights on. Then thinking, what the hell did this guy knock me out, right? And I'm thinking, man, this guy's doing some voodoo stuff on me. He really messed me up now. So went and brushed my teeth. Gums didn't bleed. First time in wow. six months. No blood overnight. So that made me think, huh, maybe something's on. So that doctor called me a little later that afternoon. Is like, so how'd you do after your first adjustment? I said, man, I don't know what you did, but, you know, I was sick before, but I wasn't this sick. I said, you made me throw up. And I said, man, that's awesome. I'm like, what do you mean? What are you talking about, man? He goes, well, think about it. You had some sort of a virus, something in your system, and we adjusted, your body woke up, and what's the quickest exit, right? Right out the front door. So, uh, but I will tell you from that point on, my whole life changed. I mean, I slept better, my energy went up, my brain worked better, my vision improved. Uh, my whole life I'd been, uh, had severe allergies. I mean, cats, everything, all of a sudden, those things disappeared, chronic lower back issue you know my dad was a chiropractor but he had to adjust me uh every time i saw him because that right. spot always out come to find out it was just a compensation for something going on higher once we got the atlas axis back in place everything else realigned and the rest is history from that point i knew what i was going to do now were you in school at that point still i was early actually that was my first year uh and so at that point i started going down to see dr kale uh, I went through his program, which is a total of uh, seven seminars a year. I went through it twice before I graduated. So I had two years left going through that. And then uh, immediately after graduation, I went on a couple of mission trips with Dr. Kale and uh, moved to North Carolina where I opened my first practice. Beautiful. That is, uh, that's, that's one hell of a story, Doc. It's powerful. And uh, a lot of the, uh, the most sound upper cervical doctors that get uh, the best results, uh, usually it saved their life in some type of way. And there's just, uh, no it's doubt. absolutely. And it's just, it's just amazing to see. So what was, what was life like in uh, early practice days? Well, so <clears throat> my dad, when he got out of school, he actually bought somebody else's existing practice had been there for 30 years. So he's to this day, he's never advertised wow. ever. And it was a small town in Kentucky. And so he just went in and it was in the town that he grew up. So everybody knew him. So by the time he moved back and opened up, everybody already knew he had heard of Dr. Drury. And then I opened my practice thinking, well, you know, <laughs> do the same thing, right? Yeah. Well, after the third month, I was Southeast regional solitaire champion. Uh, I finally decided, you know what, I better get off my butt and start making something happen. So uh, I called a uh, longtime mentor of mine, Dr. Sigafoos. And I said, Dr. Sig, I'm like, what's the best way to build a practice? And he said, you need to meet a thousand people. And I said, well, how in the hell do you do that? He said, you go out and you knock on doors and businesses, uh, you knock on residential doors. He said, and you meet people. He said, I want you to collect a thousand business cards. When you collect a thousand business cards, you will have built a business. Wow. Like, hey, okay. I didn't have anything else to do. I mean, I was sitting around the empty office. So yeah. uh, I went out and started knocking on doors. Literally, I went in, you know, in the evenings and uh, weekends, I knocked on residential doors. Uh, on the weekdays during business hours, I knocked on businesses. And I just knocked on my door, knocked on them. And actually, I put together a, back then, you know, we didn't have uh, uh, 
publisher or anything to make, you know, PDFs. I mean, I basically cut stuff out, glued it together, took it to a printer. This was 26 years ago. Took it to a, took it to a printer, all different fonts and different styles. I mean, it was, <laughs> took it to a printer and they photocopied it onto a piece of colored paper uh, with a little special offer, uh, you know, $49 first visit or something like that, you know. And I made that and I walked around and introduced myself. I said, I'm Dr. Drury. Uh, I'm an upsurgical doctor. I'm new in the area. Who do you see? And they're like, looked at me like I had two heads, right? <laughs> I'm like, they're like, what are you talking about? I'm like, well, who's your upper cervical doctor? And they're like, I don't have an upper cervical doctor. I'm like, well, you definitely need to hear what I've got to say. And, uh, you know, people started listening and uh, started building up a business. Uh, and then on top of that, I uh, started doing talks. Anywhere anybody would let me speak. I spoke at firehouses, you know, fire departments, police departments, churches, uh, Lions, Rotary, Civitans, uh, any support group I could find. <clears throat> and I was averaging. Uh, my buddy, Dr. Vanyo, and I opened at the same time in St. Louis, and we had a contest going on every week. Who could speak to the most people? And, wow. and he'll, he'll attest, we averaged two to three a week. Two to three speaking engagements a week? Within a week. And so my practice grew so fast, and I, and I was in Mooresville, which is about 30 minutes north of Charlotte. I had so many people coming from Charlotte. <clears throat> By, I opened in February. By December, I had opened my second practice really? in, in Charlotte. And so I was working three days a week in each. Gotcha. And, uh, I wound up, uh, did that for eight and a half years. I don't recommend that. Uh, <laughs> That's a lot of work. A lot of overhead, twice the overhead for the same amount of, uh, you know, the same amount of energy. And as soon as I sold that Moore's office and just opened in Charlotte, the first month that office doubled, the second month it tripled. And it wow. was just because that one energy, you know, was split, you know, not a great idea, but Absolutely. I was young and dumb and, you know, I had nothing but time and energy and, you know, I loved what I did. I wanted to tell the world and I wanted to see a million people a week and, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Now, Dr. Ray, you can, uh, you can knock on a thousand doors, collect a thousand business cards, but the, uh, the main thing is you got to start getting results. Now, um, what is knee, chest, upper cervical chiropractic, and uh, how has it been so successful for you and your patients? Well, so that is uh, the technique that B.J. Palmer um, led to in the research center. Uh, Michael Kale taught me. Uh, he practiced uh, for 43, 44 years. Uh, he had eight practices in South Carolina, very successful at it. He learned from Lyle Sherman. Uh, who obviously was uh, the head of the research center. And basically, uh, it's Atlas Axis, and um, we adjust on the knee chest, the knee posture table, which basically knees on the ground, chest on the table, head turn left or right. Uh, we do uh, instrumentation, pre's, post, uh, post rest, uh, and then post scan. So uh, we take three x-rays, uh, open mouth, base posterior, and a neutral lateral. And, uh, you know, from our, from Dr. Kale's, Dr. Palmer's estimate, there's 274 ways the top two bones can move. So we are very specific in how we correct it, but it's by hand on a knee posture table. Beautiful. And uh, same idea too, holding is healing. Can you go in a little bit about that? Absolutely. So, of course, we pre-check everyone, right, before they get adjusted. We establish a pattern. When they first come in, we'll check them three times in a row so we get a consistent pattern. That From that point on, that is, uh, that's, that's our guideline, when to adjust and when not. We don't, we don't do leg links. We don't do frills. We don't do any of that kind of stuff. We're 100% nerve energy. I mean, that dictates everything. So we check. If they're in pattern, uh, we adjust. If they're not in pattern, uh, we'll send them home. Now, every now and then, if it's questionable one way or another, you know, we have, no, I have no problem probably, oh, three to five or six times a day. If they have a questionable pattern, we'll rest them 10, 15 minutes. Uh, and then we'll post, we'll rest, we'll check them again to make a call, whether to adjust or where not to. Uh, we always obviously try to lean on the conservative side. If it's questionable, again, we usually send them home, bring them back in a day or two and see where we're at. Absolutely. Now, it's probably been pretty amazing for you to have started 26 years ago and to where the upper cervical profession is now with the plain film, the digital x-rays, and um, are you d you're doing CBCT down there, right? Yeah, yeah. What, what has that been like for you, for someone that's been through everything? 
Yeah, right. I mean, when I first got in practice, we had dip tanks, and then we moved up to the processor and uh, cleaning tanks and smell like crap. And, <laughs> you know, and, and then uh, I got digital, I guess, when I opened this office I have here was the first digital I had. That was, a let's see, Sophia is 14 years ago. Uh, and then... Um, Which is pretty early to have a digital. I'm sorry? 14, 14 years ago is pretty early to, you, you jumped on that pretty quick. Yeah, you know, I mean, we're always, I've always tried to, you know, move with the curve as quick as I could, you know, I mean, I've done everything from Blair x-rays to, uh, you know, I've tried a lot of different analysis to always try to get better at our craft. Um, but anyway, so the, uh, and then I had a CR unit for a while and now DR, which is the ultimate right now for x-ray, uh, beautiful films, you know, I mean, being able to blow them up and all this stuff was awesome. Now with the cone beam, uh, we're learning more and more uh, about the body about how to look at things uh, I will have to say definitely found more axes now with the cone beam uh, having a three-dimensional view and being able to just look at those uh, facets on the c2 c3 really uh, make it beneficial um, and actually have can definitely see a little higher you know when the atlas kind of slides up the condyle or slides down the condyle much so much easier to see when you can turn it in 3d uh, so we've definitely learned a lot with the cone beam and we're still learning Absolutely. Uh, but the technology today is, is, is awesome, man. It makes our job that much easier. Absolutely. Dr. Ray, uh, what, in your opinion, you th uh, do you think makes a sound upper cervical doctor? Well, I think, you know, there's a lot of upper cervical doctors that I think either just don't have the confidence or they don't have the, uh, the philosophical uh, foundation. You know, there's a lot of people that are like, well, I do upper cervical, but you know, I also go down and do a lumbar roll or I'll do a thoracic here and there or do some therapy or something like that. And, you know, I can't tell you how many upper cervical doctors have told me that, you know, they do upper cervical, but they do some low back stuff too. And I'm like, well, why? And they're like, well, sometimes the upper cervical spine is holding, but their back still needs to be adjusted. I'm sorry, man. That's bullshit. Mm -hmm. You, it's, it's compensation, 100% compensation. If the neck's in place, then the back is either aligned or working its way towards being aligned. So, you know, it's just a matter of, of being, you know, one thing I have to say, Dr. Kale, you know, when I first met Dr. Kale, I met him at a DE seminar. And uh, the one thing I noticed was, first of all, the room was packed. He was so passionate, so just like pounding on these green books back then. It was his black version of volume <laughs> You know, and just going, just hair flying everywhere, tearing stuff up, you know. And what attracted me most to him was I'd never seen someone that was so passionate about anything. And then I noticed at the end of his talk that there was a line down the hall around the corner, probably two, three hundred people in line to get adjusted by Dr. Kale. Like, wow. Dang, must be pretty good. Well, in that line were other people that were speaking at the seminar. They all wanted to be adjusted by Dr. Kale. So the whole time he's checking there, somebody else was checking. He was adjusting. I'm asking him questions. And he finally got to a point where he's like, what's your name, boy? You Southern guy. Yeah. I said, Ray, he said, and he comes over and he picks up one of those green book, volume 18. And he hit me in the chest with the, basically take this, read this. Don't ask me another question until <laughs> you've read it. Then we can actually have an educate, had a very real conversation. And I'm like, okay. So he shut me up pretty quick. I took the book home. I read it took me about a month because of course it's the only one BJ said you need to read three times. So, and there's a reason because some of the paragraphs I had to read over and over and over just to make sense of it. But once you make sense of it, it pretty much answers all those questions. And I will say that because of that, and the fact that Dr. Kale had me read the fight, the climb answers, history repeats up from below the bottom, all these books, bigness of the Philippine. By the time I graduated from chiropractic school, I was very, sound. I believed in what I did a hundred percent. I thought I was the best chiropractor ever walk on the planet. Obviously mm -hmm. I still have, I'm learning still today, but yeah. at the time I was very confident in what I did and, uh, and it came across to our patients. And so they were confident in me. And, you know, I think a lot of it, it starts with your intent, you know, your intent mm -hmm. has to be dead on. I had patients my first year in practice, I had cancer patients, AIDS patients, uh, babies with epilepsy. You know, I attracted a lot of really sick people and I think it was because Dr. Kale and the Green Books had instilled in me that I can, I can help those people. Those people need me. So I, I look for those people. 
right? Absolutely. So I would think, you know, what makes the best upper cervical doctors, it starts here and it starts here. You have to believe it and you have to love it with everything you got. And, uh, and believe me, they will find you. You yeah. know, I keep telling our young guys all the time, you know, they, you don't need them near as bad as they need you. You need to get that in your head. You need to know those people are dying because they don't know you exist. So it's your fault mm -hmm. if they die and they never hear about you. It's your fault. So it's your obligation. You have the knowledge. With knowledge comes responsibility. Your responsibility is to share it. If you don't get it out there, then they're the ones that are hurt. Absolutely. You know, a lot of people come out of school. These young guys are like, well, I don't want to advertise it. I don't want to go out and do talks. It, it makes me look desperate. That's bullshit. you got to get in front of people. You know, mm -hmm. Dr. B Dr. Uh, Sigafus used to say, you know, who's going to tell them about what you do? The medic? <laughs> All right. If you no don't way. tell them about what you do, then they ain't going to hear about it. Yeah. So that that's my soapbox. Absolutely. I mean, I couldn't agree more. All the best upper cervical doctors I have been around, um, it's just – confidence is just oozing out of their skin they know they can help everybody that's why i uh i that's why i get confused when um i've had a couple patients come in and like oh i called an upper cervical doctor they said they don't really deal with uh migraines or tinnitus they've never seen that and it's like that's what that's we great. do that's what we do yeah that's easy stuff yeah yeah i sent a guy uh, i sent a patient i'd had for probably a couple months was doing phenomenal uh, but she had some pretty serious cerebell cerebellar ataxia, had some pretty serious problems. This is a, you know, she's going to need care for, uh, you know, probably lifetime. Yeah. And I sent her to a guy and, uh, and she called me back afterwards and it was in another state. And she's like, Hey, listen, the guy you sent me to, you said you thought could help me. She said, I sat down with him and he said, well, I just, uh, you know, I hope your expectations aren't real high on this. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're going to do our best, but I don't know if we're going to be able to help you. And I'm like, shit. I was like, you already set that precedence now. You know she's sitting there thinking already, well, you can't help me. Yeah. You know, you already squashed it for her, right? She Absolutely. Tell her, yeah, we're going to be able Absolutely. to help you. Now, will she ever be 100%? I don't know. Yeah. But we're going to give it everything we got, and there's a good chance she definitely could be better. Yeah, absolutely. Much we don't know, right, until we get in. And do you think uh, people, because, uh, you know, some of these, we see, we see some uh, very chronic, serious neurological issues that – True healing takes time. You know, it's going to be up and down. It's going to take several months. Do you think people stick with you and your treatment longer because they do believe in you and uh, they believe in the work you do? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think so. And also, you know, for a while, when I first got into practice, I was doing like really short, like six-week, eight-week care plans, you know, with somebody who's had 50 years of degeneration, you know, it was stupid. You know, mm -hmm. Dr. John Baker uh, is my mentor now. And, you know, and he's kind of like, he's like, Drury, now, what do you do at the end of six, eight weeks, 12 weeks? You know, what do you do? You put them on maintenance? And I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, now, you really think they're at, that, at, at maintenance level at that point? I'm like, no, not really. He's like, right. He goes, so sell them what they need. Don't, don't do it. Don't do what you think they want to hear. Do mm -hmm. what you really need. You're the doctor. You set the precedent and set the plan out with the expectations that you can literally expect. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, and then it's up to them. And, you know, when I started doing that, it changed so much because now I actually, I prescribe for them what I really think they need. And I have more people actually accepting care than I used to, you know, and what would happen was they come in for eight weeks, 12 weeks or whatever. And then they're only got up to a certain level and they know they're not well. And they're like, well, why'd you tell me I needed only, two months or three yeah. months of care when I'm not where I need to be. You know, I mean, I started to see that. And yeah. so now I, I tell them what they really need. Uh, we're all cash. They pay up front before we even get the first adjustment. And uh, they're a lot happier. We're a lot happier. We get the money out of the way. And then it's like, yeah. man, now let's just go to work. Let right? the healing begin. Absolutely. Doc, how do you think we get uh, more doctors doing this work? Because um, we, we just, uh, it's, it's one of the most amazing uh, techniques on the planet in terms of healing. And uh, you get a lot of students really fired up about it in the beginning, but you see, you see some drop out and uh, we, we just need more people doing the work because it's, it's life-saving. And how do you yeah. think we do that? Well, you know, before, uh, this is a whole nother podcast, but I did upper cervical health centers about, uh, 2006 and seven. We had, uh, at one point we had 63 upper cervical health centers all over the country. Drew, Drew, your buddy, Drew Hall can tell you a little bit about it. But 
we had a big annual conference, the Upper Circle Evolution, where we would have 300, 400 people come from all over the country. Uh, and I, I, me personally, but then several of us would go into every to schools, any, to anywhere we could and talk to them about what we did. I mean, really, you know, they're not going to learn, they're going to learn some basics, but they're not going to learn real upper cervical, not good enough to be proficient at it in school. Uh, so the best thing for us to do is when we can is to get to those schools, mm. go and speak to them and, you know, get them at that grassroots level. Uh, you have a lot more success getting them at the younger age when they're still trying to figure out what they want to do than those that go out and kind of get somewhat comfortable. Uh, you know, I teach NHS, so uh, in our organization, probably about maybe 15 to 20 percent of our organization are people that were in practice that realized they weren't getting the results they wanted. Uh, so they looked elsewhere and they, you know, so practicing doctors, but probably 80 percent of our of our people, our students that are, you know, learning now so that when they do get to that point, like I was, uh, they come out, you know, with the, with the tools they need to, to make, get success. So I think we need to just get in front of them, man. We got yeah. to go, all of us need to take time from our practices and, and go and promote what we do. And, and that, that's the only way. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's huge to have uh, uh, almost like a, I think everybody in the upper cervical field, if you want to be successful, has to have some type of uh, mentor because you're going to run into some things that you haven't seen before with all the uh, people coming through. And I think it's very important to have somebody like you and Drew Hall and people that have been doing a while um, yeah. that, that you are doing, reaching out, talking to the kids, saying I'm here for you, goes a long way. The mentor is huge, man. I had several of them. Dr. Kell was mine until he passed away. And then Dr. Sigafoos until he passed away. Uh, and Dr. John Baker, you know, fortunately he ain't passed away. But uh, so, you know, I mean, I, I've always had a mentor. You know, it's like Tiger Woods, you know, he's always had a coach. Yeah. You, know, you can be the best in the world, but you still need guidance mm -hmm. along the way, right? Absolutely. Now, doc, Dr. Ray, I have a question for you, too. Um, you have uh, you've come a long way. You've been practicing, what, 26 years, you said? How, mm -hmm. how many practices have you set up? <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. I've set up – well, I had five in Italy at one time. That's a, another podcast. Uh, and I've had uh, one, two – three, four, five in Charlotte. And well, in North Carolina, one was in Hickory, the rest were one in Mooresville, and then the other three were in Charlotte. Now, from a fired up kid just getting out of school till now, what are your goals and where, where do you want your practices and how, how does it look for you, someone that's already accomplished a lot in the field? Like how, how does upper cervical and your practice look for you now? So, what, I mean, I, I usually recommend most of these guys uh, not go out and try to reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. uh, the best bet is to find a mentor that has already been where you've been. You can save years and literally millions of dollars learning from someone by going and working with someone for a while. I mean, that's just, I mean, I didn't have that opportunity. Dr. Kill was the only person anywhere near us and he already had his practices full. Uh, there just wasn't anyone for me to learn the business side of things. And you know, they don't teach any of that in chiropractic school. Mm -hmm. I learned school of hard knocks and I busted my butt. I didn't have any kids. I didn't have any family at that time. So all I had was time and energy, but it took everything I had uh, as to where if I had gone and learned from somebody, you know, I could have cut that learning curve in half. I wouldn't have done stupid things like open two offices in my first year, stuff like that, you know? Yeah. But so, how, how does it look for you? Like uh, somebody that's, uh, that's where you're at now. Do you want to practice until the rest of your days? Do you want to cut back? How, how does, how does everyday practice look for you at this moment in your life? Okay. Well, right now I have two other doctors in my practice mm -hmm. and they work more than I do, which is cool. They don't see quite as many people as I do, but they still work more than I do. They're in there five days a week. Um, and uh, I'm kind of reeling back a little bit, you know, I mean, at this point in my life, I really get more pleasure out of seeing those guys. Yeah. You know, the smile on their face when they get that, uh, you know, that uh, Parkinson's patient comes in and they get adjusted and they're walking out like that. And, you know, these people come in and they're, you know, they're sleeping through the night, you know, they, they, that, that, that's cool. Right. I mean, and, and until you actually put your hands on people and you actually see that, uh, you know, it's just a belief and then it becomes a knowing. So for me, I'm reeling back a little bit. Uh, I'm probably going to work more on opening some other practices uh, with some of these young docs and helping them get going and, and teaching them the ropes uh, in the North Carolina area. 
but uh, you know, I mean, I still, you know, I still, I was there this morning at 7:30 at the office, even though I didn't have patients. But I still get excited about you know going in and you know what's going to happen uh, uh, each day, I, each Absolutely. and every day. And um, and as far as uh, managing, because uh, you seem like uh, like a hard worker like myself and when you were starting up the family and everything was it hard for you to how did you balance that because i'm we're working long hours we're seeing a lot of people and then you got you got the family too yeah you know i mean there's certain things that you know when you're a chiropractor there's certain things that you kind of have to your family has to understand that for one like we do classes you know there's some nights i don't get home till eight o'clock because we're doing patient orientation classes we got to educate our people um, and yeah, you know, there's times where you have events going on, you know, I still do quite a few seminars. So my weekends are gone here and there. Uh, fortunately, my wife has been able to, you know, she's been home with the kids since they were born. So, you know, she can take care of a lot of that kind of stuff. And then, you know, when we do have time together, it's, it's special time, right? You know, yeah. we, uh, because financially we have the ability, you know, when, you know, we go on a lot of trips together, we spend a lot of, you know, where, cause we're, we all go different directions. Both of my kids pay competitive basketball year round, you know, they're constantly on the go. I'm constantly on the go. So we set aside times and we plan those out. Beautiful. So and I'll spend time together still, even though we all have busy lives. Absolutely. So, Dr. Ray, where can people find you online? Where are your practices for anybody that's uh, looking for uh, knee chest upper cervical chiropractic in the North Carolina area? Well, you can go to kneechestsociety.com. Uh, that will lay out our program. Uh, now, uh, most all of our stuff is online. Uh, and then we have five seminars a year, four hands-on, solely just training seminars, uh, no PowerPoints, just everybody gets in different groups and we work on wherever you are at that point, we bring you up to the next level. And then we have our annual conference this year is gonna be at the Grove Park Inn uh, in October. In, in Asheville and that's our our big conference where we'll have guest speakers come from all over the world and uh, that's always a blast the Grove Park a beautiful place where where BJ wrote the bigness beautiful and uh, at the end of uh, the podcast I used to like I like to ask all my guests what is one piece of advice that has really resonated with you over the years that you would like to gift the audience could be absolutely anything um well you know f for the younger crowd um, I feel like that, that a lot of times you guys have been misled the fact that think that you're owed something uh, like, you know, how you went through school and you're like, think you paid your dues at that point. You know, that just gives you the opportunity now to really get out. And now you can have the opportunity to work. Mm -hmm. um, if you will come out of school and if you open your practice with the idea that it's a mission that you've got to get in front of as many people as you can uh, that you paid your, you went through school to get the opportunity now to be a doctor and to be able to help people. And you just, it's just got to be a mission. It's got to be a purpose. It's got to be something that you would, you would give up everything for. And if it, when you get to that point, uh, it will become going to work will be like vacation. It'll be like, you get up every morning excited, can't wait to get in there. Uh, and it'll be a lot of fun. And when it becomes a lot of fun, uh, you can make a lot of money. I Absolutely. mean, you can be very successful doing this. And, you know, I know most of us don't become chiropractors for the money because there's a lot easier ways to make money. But when you do it for the right reason, because you love it, you love people, and you want to change lives, the money just shows yeah, up. Yeah, becomes a byproduct, definitely. Right. Dr. Drury, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, really uh, appreciate your knowledge and wisdom and uh, your dedication to the upper cervical work. And I would love to have you back on anytime. Yeah, man. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. And uh, now what part of the world are you? I'm in New Jersey. Okay. Yeah. Right. I, don't, I don't know if you know uh, Dr. Meg Banich, but she was up in New Jersey for a long time. I took over her practice. Oh, I love Meg. Awesome. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. So I've been doing it for four years up here and uh, going Sweet. strong and just, you know, doing the best I can to spread the word of upper cervical. Hey, Meg was in part of Upper Health Centers for many years. Yeah, she's great. I love oh, Meg. She's great. Later on. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Awesome. Well, thanks for the opportunity, Kevin. I appreciate it, man. It was, it was All good. All right, Doc. I'll talk to you soon.